This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk about my favorite stablecoin, which is something called DAI. If you're interested in learning how the economy actually works so you can make money in both bull and bear markets, or you just want to see what I'm trading or investing in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So DAI is a stablecoin that's produced by a protocol called the Maker DAO. We're going to go into all these terms so they make a little bit more sense, but let's just sort of sketch out the context for this. Now, if you've watched my other videos, you know that I'm a bit of a Bitcoin maximalist. I like to value my wealth in Bitcoin, but I'm also very interested in the DeFi space, and I recognize that there are problems that it can solve. Now, a big problem for a lot of people, it's not a problem for me because I just buy Bitcoin and I'm lucky enough that I can just stick it away and not watch it. It's a long-term investment for me. But a lot of a big problem for a lot of people is that Bitcoin and Ethereum, Ether, are very volatile, especially volatile versus the U.S. dollar as well as versus various fiat currencies. And so let's say, for example, you live in uh, Argentina or some other country, or even the U.S., and you're getting paid in Bitcoin every two weeks as your paycheck. And then what you do is you just you sell that Bitcoin for U.S. dollars. You use that to pay your rent. Well, if Bitcoin happens to crash right when you get paid and you need to pay your rent, you might not be able to pay your rent in U.S. dollars. So I think Bitcoin's a very good long-term investment, but obviously in the short term, it can sort of trade anywhere. Or let's say that you live in Argentina or Venezuela or one of these countries that has a very uh, unstable financial system. And let's say you want to get paid in U.S. dollars, uh, but your employer is just not able to get their hands on any U.S. dollars because capital flows are limited and, and the local banks charge these outrageous fees to get their hands on dollars. Uh, but you'd like to get paid in dollars. You don't want to get paid in Bitcoin or Ethereum because they're too too volatile, you, you need the money to spend right away. Or let's say that you're in the US, you don't have to be in Argentina or Venezuela, let's say you're in Australia or Europe or the US or Canada, and you hate your local banks, you think their service is really bad. And let's say, we'll say you're in the US, um, just to make it really easy, and you're tired of the very low interest rates, and uh, whether you're in the US or not, you want to keep holding some money, some of your wealth in US dollars, because you want to spend in US dollars, or you just like the stability of it. Even though US dollars lose their value over time, they're fairly stable at uh, weekly, monthly, maybe even annual periods of time. And so you want to hold your wealth in US dollars, but you don't want to deal with banks, with regulations, with KYC, uh, know your customer. The solution to this would be stable coins. Stable coins are a form of cryptocurrency that are stable against a certain peg. It's usually, stable coins are usually stable against the US dollar. Now yesterday I talked about the USDC coin, the USDC, um, USD coin or USDC. You can go back and watch that video. Uh, but just to briefly review, USDC, just like uh, Tether, is a form of non-algorithmic stable coin. It's not really backed by a protocol or software code. It's centralized and as such, you need to be able to trust the underlying company to hold enough actual real US dollars to back your stablecoin. Because you could have the problem with the stablecoin if a lot of people want to turn in their stablecoins, they want to sell their USDC for US dollars, and the centralized company doesn't have enough US dollars, you could have a real problem. And so there's still an element of trust in these non-algorithmic stable, um, stable coins, centralized stable coins. They can also be confiscated by the company, they can be just sort of turned off, they can be confiscated by the US government. And if you watch yesterday's video, which I'll link to below, I talk about a couple of cases where this has happened with Tether and USDC, which is basically backed by Circle, Goldman Sachs, Coinbase, these kind of companies, especially companies like Goldman Sachs that I don't personally wanna be able to, wanna have to trust. So those are non-algorithmic stable coins. What we're gonna talk about today is a stable coin called DAI, which is an algorithmic stable coin. It's blocked, it's, it is backed purely by software. It's backed purely by software. As such, it's decentralized, it cannot be confiscated, it's censorship resistant, you don't have to worry about someone freezing your PayPal account or freezing your ba bank account. And again, this is for people, I'm not suggesting that we need to uh, have money that we can use for illegal activities. This is just, there are many examples of people, PayPal, PayPal accounts, for example, that have been frozen just because they said something that no one liked 
on Twitter, or and you never know what the next thing is going to be. So this is not intended, at least by me, to be used for legal purposes, but this is a way of sort of existing outside the current financial system. That being said, I still encourage you to pay taxes, abide by all the laws as I do. But I think this is a very interesting uh, new form. This is all decentralized finance we're talking about here, or DeFi. But this is a form of stablecoin, DAI is a form of stablecoin that's decentralized, censorship, censorship resistant, and also borderless. Anyone can use it anywhere, anywhere that has an, an internet connection. Unlike if you think about a bank account, for example, uh, you might go to the bank and they just decide that they don't want to open up a bank account for you. Or maybe you're in a different country and so you can't open up an account with Wells Fargo. And even if in the US, you probably don't want to have an account with Wells Fargo because they don't pay you any interest and it's a really uh, pretty bad bank. So we turn to this protocol called MakerDAO. It's a DeFi protocol. As I said, it's, it's basically software, it's smart contracts that run on the Ethereum network and as such uses Ether, ETH. Uh, DeFi, as I said, just stands for decentralized finance. Centralized finance would be you have a bank, you have a stock exchange, etc. Decentralized would mean that it's distributed across the internet, everyone has access. A DeFi protocol just means that it is a form of software uh, that runs on its own. And we could say that perhaps there are human beings tinkering around the edges, but the core is meant to be autonomous and running on its own. The, the creator of the MakerDAO DeFi protocol is Maker. That's the story of the parent organization. And as time has progressed, Maker has sort of receded more and more into the background and has turned over control and governance to holders of the Maker tokens, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But there is this sort of parent organization. These are programmers who are developers who are working and have been working on this. A DAO is just short for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So it's not, Maker is not a corporation. It's actually a DAO. It's a decentralized organization of people who are slowly replacing themselves with the software. And at this point, I think we could say that DeFi, that MakerDAO runs uh, on its own. Now, one way you measure the significance of a DeFi protocol is how much ETH is locked up. This is how much Ether, which is the cryptocurrency, is locked up in the protocol. And we're going to talk a little bit about what locked up means. But MakerDAO is one of the big DeFi protocols, which is why I'm talking about it. At this point, about 1.2, 1.3 billion worth of ETH is locked up in it out of a total supply, current supply or market cap of about 41 billion ETH. So 3% of all ETH is locked into this protocol, which is quite significant. If you want to see different protocols, you can always go to DeFi Pulse, and this gives you an idea of the total value, the total amount of ETH that's locked up in DeFi, decentralized finance, as well as where it's being locked up uh, in. Aave is currently number one with $1.39 billion worth of ETH locked up. Maker or MakerDAO is right here with one point, uh, now it's 1.26. And there are a couple other ones here we're gonna talk about. Uh, Uniswap is very interesting. Compounds, synthetics are interesting. Uh, uh, urine as well. There's just a lot to cover. But Maker, I think, is a good place to start. If you wanna see market caps, you can always go to Coin, uh, Coin Market Cap here, and it shows you that Ethereum, Ether is number uh, two next to, uh, next to Bitcoin. So how does MakerDAO, how does DAI work? Basically, MakerDAO, the software protocol, eats Ether. It locks it up and it turns it into a stable coin. This solves the stability problem that we have with cryptocurrencies like Ether and Bitcoin. So this is a way of, uh, it's, a, it's a basically a protocol that eats ETH and turns it into this stable form of cryptocurrency called a DAI. Now one DAI, which is the name of the stable coin, is theoretically equal to approximately one US dollar. We'll see that it fluctuates around this and how it's controlled, but it's basically a stable coin that's intended to stay as close to one dollar as possible. So that's DAI. There are two cryptocurrencies we're dealing with here. MKR, which is the maker token, is a governance token that's used to vote on the protocol. And this, this is how it's controlled in a decentralized way. We're going to be focusing on DAI, but you need to know about Maker as well, just to understand how the MakerDAO protocol works. 
So this is basically how you create new DAI. You can become your own central bank. Your own MakerDAO allows anyone to become a bank or a central bank and print new money, print new stable coins. And the way this works is you deposit $150 worth of ETH into a Maker Vault. It gets locked up, hence we talk about Ether locked up in, in DeFi. It gets locked up, and this allows you to mint one DAI, which is equal to approximately one US dollar. So you can see this is an over collateralized loan, basically. DAI is a loan that's backed by ETH as collateral. One DAI is equal to about a dollar, but you have to put up a dollar fifty in order to create one DAI. So this means that it's over collateralized, and this makes sure that there's always enough money there if you need to redeem your die. Now we'll talk a little bit later about why anyone would lock up a hundred, lock up a dollar fifty to take back out a dollar. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but this is how it works. And I'll show you that there are very interesting things you can do with this. So die, it's a stable coin. It's basically a loan that's backed by ETH as collateral. And as such, it's over collateralized because to get one die out of the system, you have to put in a dollar fifty worth of ETH. Now, because this is a loan, you have to pay an interest rate on it. And this, this interest rate is called the stability fee. That's just the name for it. The stability fee, and you'll see why, because this is a stable coin, it's intended to, to maintain this peg with the US dollar. But basically, the stability fee needs to be paid in maker tokens. And you'll see later why that is significant. So if one die if the peg begins to break, the peg with the US dollar, and one die is trading below one dollar, the stability fee will increase. And what this means is that on the margins, people who hold die are not going to want to pay a higher fee on margin, um, or the marginal holder, I should say. And so this will cause some die holders to want to pay back their loans early. Basically, they'll trade back in their die, they'll get their ETH back, and when they do that, this die will be burned, it will be destroyed, thus lowering the total supply of die. And when you have a lower supply of die versus the dollar, this will bring the price of die back up towards a dollar. So that's what happens when die slips below a dollar. You can think of it as sort of like a Fed interest rate increase. And it basically is intended to bring the value of the die back up towards a dollar. Now, what happens if a die is priced above a dollar, which has been happening lately? Well, if one die is equal to more than a dollar, this stability fee will decrease. This is a little bit like a central bank interest rate cut. It'll make it more attractive to take out die loans and to hold die, which will create more die. So you'll have an increase of people locking up their ETH, creating more die, thus increasing the supply. And higher supply given fixed demand means lower prices, basic supply and demand curves. And this will drive the price of die back towards a dollar. So when the price of dies below a dollar, they raise interest rates. The stability fee increases. When the price of die is above a dollar, they cut interest rates, they cut the stability fee. And this is how algorithmically this peg between one die and one US dollar is maintained. As we said, this is a, it's a form of monetary policy, essentially decentralized monetary policy. And so for this reason, some people like to think of MakerDAO as, and it's almost an oxymoron, a decentralized central bank, because how can you be decentralized and centralized at the same time? But it's a substitute. So it's a new version, a much better substitute rather than having uh, 12 people sitting in a room and especially one guy, Jerome Powell, making interest rate decisions. Uh, this is a way of doing it, just using software code and taking politics out of the equation taking investment bankers out of the equation, taking private equity people out of the equation, people like Jerome Powell, and doing it in a decentralized way. That's one reason I'm very excited about DeFi. I sort of like the, the, the political intention behind it. Now, I said that in order to create one DAI, you need to deposit $1.50 worth of ETH. I, I was simplifying just to make it easy at first. Basically, when you have... $1.50 of ETH backing $1 worth of die, or $150 of ETH backing $100 worth of die. This is the point of liquidation. This is actually like getting a margin call. So in practice, 
you should always post more collateral. You should post $200 to take out $100 and die or $300 to take out $100 and die because uh, at the point of $150 or 150% collateralized, you will uh, have a liquidation. This is what happens during a liquidation. Basically, the computer, the software code will automatically sell your ETH in the open market for the maker token. And then those maker tokens will be burned. Basically, you get a margin call and your, your uh, ETH is liquidated. So your ETH will be uh, taken out of the smart contract, out of the ETH die smart contract. It will be sold automatically on the open market for maker tokens. And then those maker tokens will be burned or destroyed, which basically lowers the supply of the maker governance token, thus slightly increasing the price for all maker holders, holders of this governance token. In addition, you'll have to pay a 13% penalty fee in maker tokens if you get this sort of margin call, this sort of liquidation. And then these this penalty fee is used to buy maker tokens on the open market and they're burned as well, which benefits the holders of the governance token. So as I said, in practice, you should probably deposit something closer to $300 in ETH to take out $100 worth of DAI. Uh, or you should at least deposit, I should say, $151 worth of ETH because once it hits that $150 worth, once you're only 150% um, uh, over collateralized, that's the point at which the software, the protocol, will liquidate your contract. The nice thing about depositing $300 worth of ETH to take out $100 worth of DAI is that ETH can drop 50% in price before you get liquidated. So if ETH were to crash, if the price of ETH were to crash, 50% and you have $300 worth of ETH in a maker vault, it crashes 50%, then you get your margin call. So as long as it doesn't crash 50%, you are fine. So in practice, you should over collateralize these loans even more than the protocol encourages you to do. Now, let's talk a little bit about the maker token. As I said, it's the governance token. The maker DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's run by the holders of these maker tokens. And the holders of maker tokens vote to determine the interest rate on the die loans. In other words, to determine the stability fee. And also they vote to decide what can be accepted as collateral to create new die. So you used to have what was called single collateral die or SI, which was basically die that was just backed by ETH. Now they've added more forms of collateral, which in, in theory makes the stable coin more stable because it's not dependent on one volatile underlying asset like ETH. Now it's multi, there's multi-collateral die. So you can post ETH, you can post basic attention token, BAT. Uh, you, can pa you can post something called wrapped Bitcoin, which I need to talk about in some video. I'm not a huge fan of it. I prefer to hold Bitcoin itself. But you can post all these things, including USDC, which is a centralized stable coin. In practice, there's very, very little USDC backing, uh, backing die. But it's basically the holders of this maker token who get to decide what is to be used as collateral. And if they make a bad decision, they only hurt themselves because the maker tokens will, will do well as MakerDAO grows and is successful and takes over the world. If they make really stupid decisions and they say, for example, you can post bananas as collateral to create DAI, then the whole system suffers and the holders of the maker token who actually have to use real money to buy it, they have to use their fiat money or use their Bitcoin or use their ETH to buy maker tokens, they will lose money. So everyone is incented the correct way. Uh, if you hold one maker token, you get one vote. And like I said, if holders of these maker governance tokens make good decisions, then the value of maker, the token, will go up over time. In addition, all the stability fees, as we said, the interest payments are paid in maker tokens. And when you pay off your loan, these maker tokens are burned and that creates, um, that basically uh, lowers the supply and uh, should increase the price of maker tokens, which is good for all maker holders. As we said now, uh, MakerDAO can use ETH, wrapped Bitcoin, BAT, and USDC to fund uh, DAI, DAI loads, uh, to basically to print more DAI or mint more, or more DAI. This is as of June 10th, 2020. Now, if we look at an actual chart of DAI versus the US dollar, again, remember, we're talking about a stable coin that should trade 
right around a dollar. The pink line here is approximately one dollar. I couldn't make it exactly, but it's basically one dollar. You can see that there's been a premium for dye over US dollars. Now, one of the nice things about this is the premium seems to increase at points of market volatility. So if you're holding dye, it, you actually get some upside if there's a stock market crash or a COVID problem uh, or some liquidity crisis. You can see that there's a lot of people fleeing into dye in March during that crash. And then the most recent sort of mini crash that we had in September, you get these spikes where it moves from maybe a dollar and two cents per die up to a dollar and seven cents and went as high as a dollar and nine and a half cents, it looks like. And as such, uh, this is not, it's not a perfect stable coin. You can see there are points at which it does trade exactly equal to a dollar. But this is something that you have to keep in mind as well. If you buy a die at 102 per dollar and you need to convert it back to, to real US dollars and uh, it's fallen back to one, you might be losing 2%. As we'll see in practice, uh, there are ways of making up for this with the interest rate you can earn on die. But it's something to keep in mind that this is an, an algorithmic stable coin. And as such, its value has been fluctuating. As it becomes more widespread, if this protocol turns out to be successful, this, this, uh, this uh, peg with the US dollar will, will be more constant. It will stay much closer to $1 and you won't get these spikes. But the nice thing about these spikes, at least to my eyes, they appear to go the right direction. When things get bad and you're holding die, you actually end up doing better than you do holding US dollars. In other words, when this chart moves up in this direction, the die is strengthening against the US dollar. When the chart moves down, the die is weakening against the US dollar. Again, all currencies you have to measure against a trading pair. Now, why might you want to hold die? What's another reason besides the fact that it can't be confiscated, you can send it around the world, etc.? Well, one reason is you can earn a higher interest rate on die than you can earn on US dollars. So here's another, this is another DeFi protocol called Compound, which I need to make a video about at some point. And basically, you can buy, you can take some die, you can buy some die, or you can basically deposit some Ethereum at MakerDAO, take out some die, send it to the Compound Protocol, and you can earn a what's basically a fluctuating interest rate. And I believe it it, it changes every day. But right now, if you supply die into the Compound Protocol, you make on an annualized basis about 5.79%. Now this can obviously move up or down over time, but it's a much higher interest rate than the 1% or less that you're probably getting on your US dollars at your bank. So this is one way to get DAI. You can go to MakerDAO, you can deposit, um, go to MakerDAO here, you can send them some ETH, you can take out DAI, you can actually mint DAI. Another way to do it, which is not as anonymous, and does involve KYC, know your customer, is you can just go to Coinbase and you can buy DAI. So basically here, I'm, I can put, I say I wanna buy 100 DAI, and I wanna buy it uh, approximately where it's trading right now at $1.5. And one and of US dollars per die, and you can see I'll just pay 36 a 36 cent fee, and it'll cost me basically $101.86 to buy 100, 100 die. Now, the problem with this then is, of course, everyone knows who you are on Coinbase. You have to give them your name and address and your whole life history. Um, but this is another easy way to get die if you're not worried about anonymity. You can just buy it here. You could actually theoretically trade it too. You could buy some die when it's at a dollar and sell it when it's at a dollar four and make, you know, 4% over a short, short period of time. So there are different ways of, of playing this as well. You could buy die here, send it to compound and start earning an interest rate on it. As we said, Coinbase is, uh, complies with US KYC, know your customer as such. There's not the same anonymity as you would have if you just do it all online. Now, why would anyone, let's say you, you've, you're you making new die, you're minting new die by depositing uh, ETH collateral or some other form of collateral, why would you ever wanna take out a loan when you need to post $150 in collateral? This is not like a traditional loan. If I, if I uh, wanna buy a house, for example, the house stands as collateral 
and I can actually borrow money. In this case, it's a little bit like borrowing money from, from yourself because you post $150 and you only get to take $100 out, or you post $300 and you only get to take $100 out. And so why would anyone ever do this? Well, let's say that you're a long-term holder of Ether, of Ethereum, of ETH, the crypto, and you think it's going up, and uh, but you do need to pay some of your bills. Well, what you could do as a long-term holder of ETH is you could just deposit it into the MakerDAO. You could then deposit it into Compound and start earning an interest rate on it, earning some interest income, and or you could just uh, use it to pay some of your... Uh, Basically, you could deposit your ETH into MakerDAO, take out some DAI, convert them into US dollars, or just spend them as DAI and pay some of your bills. And the nice thing about this is it's not a taxable event. You, you will not be selling your ETH. You're just depositing it. And if you're careful and don't get liquidated, if you're careful to post enough collateral so you don't hit that 150% liquidation point, you can basically have your ETH and eat it too. You can spend a little bit of it and uh, may, or maybe earn some interest on it and still hold it as a long-term holder and be able to pay that long-term capital gains tax. So you can do this the same with stocks. You can borrow against them and um, or borrow against your home. And it's not a ta taxable event. You just pay, uh, you pay your interest. And in many cases, that interest is deductible, which is nice. What's another reason? Well, here's the really kind of tricky thing you can do that is, is quite dangerous, in fact, uh, but uh, some people will still choose to, to, to use a lot of leverage. Here's something funny you can do. So let's say you deposit uh, $300 worth of ETH into MakerDAO. You pull out $100 worth of DAI. Now you can take that DAI, you can go right back to Coinbase, and you can buy more ETH with it. So for example, they have a, an ETH, um, they have an ETH DAI, a trading pair. No, it's, it's not coming up right now. Uh, but basically, you can pull that die out of the, the, the MakerDAO and you can use it to buy some more ETH. And then you can take that $100 of ETH that you just bought, you can stick it back into MakerDAO, pull out another loan of $66. Again, this is assuming you're going to over collateralize it by 150%. In practice, you probably want to do a lot less than that. Maybe in this case, you do $40 worth. And then you can use that to buy more ETH. This is a way of really levering up an ETH position. If ETH falls, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And so uh, this is a high risk, high reward way of levering up ETH and trading it with leverage. So those are different things that you can do. Obviously, you can just use DAI if you can send it around the world. Maybe you want to get paid in DAI. Maybe you want to buy something from someone online using DAI. It functions like US dollars. So you don't have to do anything fancy with it. You can just buy some DAI. Uh, on Coinbase or wherever, you could send it to China, you could send it to South America, you could send it uh, to your friend, you could send it anywhere. And it's all outside the current financial system. So let's just step back and review what we've learned. We have this ecosystem, this DeFi protocol that's called MakerDAO. It eats ETH and spits out a stable coin called DAI. MakerDAO ecosystem also includes the governance token, which is MKR, the maker token. This is used to maintain the peg of the stablecoin, as we talked about. It's also used for governance, for voting on stability fees, what should be accepted as collateral, etc. And the third part of the, the MakerDAO ecosystem, you have the stablecoin, DAI, you have the governance token, maker, is the collateral itself, which in this case is still mostly Ether. And Ether does seem to be the best form of collateral in the DeFi ecosystem. And so what this suggests is, is that if DeFi protocols like MakerDAO continue to grow, they're going to eat more ETH. They're going to lock up more ETH inside the protocol. And as such, this takes ETH off the secondary markets and is very bullish for ETH. This is one reason that I've become increasingly bullish on ETH, though I don't I own like $100 of it right now that I'm just playing around with. Uh, I have a much bigger position in Bitcoin, which is what I'm really excited about. But I'm using ETH to explore the whole DeFi ecosystem, including the MakerDAO protocol, which I think is an interesting place to start. Hopefully this all made sense. This is very complicated. There are lots of moving parts. But if you watch this video a couple times and maybe go to the MakerDAO website and read their documentation as well, you'll get a feel for this. I'm still learning about it and learning about how to articulate it. 
If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe, like button, hit the notification bell so you can be notified when my next video comes out. And let me know your questions and comments in the comments section below. I hope to get back to doing some momentum stocks as well, as well as exploring uh, a little bit more about Bitcoin and other protocols in the DeFi ecosystem. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you in the next video.